and welcome to Sonder. My name is Maggie and I am a knitter, sewist, bibliophile, general crafter, and new doctor living here in Denver, Colorado. Um, I am coming to you from Sunday, May 16th, and I cannot believe it's like halfway through May. This is actually insane. Um, and it's been a while. It's been almost another month. So, so sorry these have been sort of few and far between, but I have just been so, so busy and mostly doing fun things. So, um, since I saw you last, I spent about a week working at the VA hospital here in Denver, Colorado, and then I had the amazing and beautiful opportunity to fly to Brooklyn, New York and spend a week with one of my oldest friends in the world. Um, and it was amazing. Uh, the weather in Brooklyn was insane this last week. Literally, it was 65 to 75, sunny, beautiful. Oh, it was incredible. We rented an Airbnb in New York, in Brooklyn, and I don't remember exactly the neighborhood that we were in because there are so many neighborhoods and I was just along for the ride. Uh, some people, and I feel a little bit funny admitting this because I feel like there is definitely in most relationships a strict dichotomy between sort of the planners and the like people who tag along. And in most relationships, the planner is the woman because gender stereotypes the patriarchy, etc. But that is not the way that my relationship works. Um, so my husband planned everything and I got to just get in a plane and go visit Miriam, my best friend and oldest friend. So um, we have known each other since we were 11 years old. And, <laughs> um, and this was the longest we'd gone without seeing each other, which was crazy. The last time that we saw each other was in December of 2019. December of 2019, which is insane. Um, it's the longest we've gone without seeing each other literally since we were 11 years old. And that includes us living apart. So I spent a year living in Slovakia. She spent a couple years living in Paris, which I visited her in Paris, obviously, but we have lived in different continents and seeing each other more. So it was crazy. It was just so insane to not see her for so long and really truly felt like a breath of fresh air to get a hug from someone who you adore and haven't been able to embrace in a really long time. We were both fully vaccinated. So um, everyone on the trip was fully vaccinated. My husband has been fully vaccinated and Miriam have both been fully vaccinated for about a month now. And I obviously as a doctor was fully vaccinated in about January. I can't remember if it was January or early February, but early in the year. And while we were in New York, the CDC passed um, new recommendations stating that fully vaccinated adults can stop social distancing practices, which is insane. <laughs> um, we were still social distancing when we were out and about um, in New York because mostly habit and to make other people feel more comfortable and to follow a lot of sort of state guidelines that are still in place, but it feels like we're sort of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and the end to this horrible, horrible um, year and a half is is near, which is incredible. It's hard because I was just watching the um, Gentle Knitter podcast and Knit Lib, um, two podcasts that are amazing, uh, and uh, our women in Canada who are sort of documenting their own lives and their experiences and things in Canada appear to be from what they've said, very bad still. And so my heart goes out to them and we're just getting through it the best we can. I think this has been such a challenging year and it's been really beautiful to be able to go and visit 
family and I'm just really, really thankful for the opportunity to have gotten vaccinated, you know. Um, the vaccination rates in Colorado are quite high, the vaccination rates in New York are quite high and so it felt like a really safe vacation and I needed it. I needed to get out of Colorado. Despite Colorado being one of the most beautiful and amazing places to live in the world, I still just am someone who normally am traveling and seeking out new experiences and it was so, so bizarre to not be able to do that for so long. So it was incredible. We essentially it was just a feeding frenzy. We ate a lot. <laughs> Like that is essentially what our vacation was, was eating and looking at art and doing a little bit of shopping, um, but mostly just eating. And you know, when you go to New York, I feel like that's kind of what you want to do is just eat. Um, while I was there though, I did have the opportunity to meet with a tattoo artist named Sam who works at All Wolves No Sheep. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because I'm an editor, but you know, all sheep, no wolves is my general preference. But uh, she works at All Wolves, No Sheep in Brooklyn, New York, and she did a tattoo for me, which was amazing. I have been wanting to get this tattoo for quite a while, and it is an ode to a book series that has been very near and dear to my heart for a very long time. However, with the caveat, that the author of this series has proven herself to be a real piece of shit. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, um, if you don't know or can't read my mind, I'm talking about Harry Potter, of course. And this is the series I feel, you know, this is the series that taught me to love reading. This is the series that got me through medical school and has helped me get through residency. It is something that I come back to. It's a world that I come back to, to feel safe and comfortable and, um, and know that all the things are kind of going to work out in the end and that good will overcome evil. And it sucks because um, J.K. Rowling has come out with some very, very hurtful and ignorant um, statements regarding the trans population that I definitely, definitely do not agree with. And I have chosen to separate the art that she created, the world that she created that got me through a lot from her self. And so everyone I think is free to make their own decisions on how they feel about Harry Potter. Um, but for me, it's been a really important safe haven. And I hate that it's not a safe haven for the trans community right now because of the things, the very hurtful and awful um, things that JK Rowling has said. But for me, it has been that place. And it's the place that brought me to, learn, to love reading and has brought me a lot of solace and joy over the last several years. And so with that, I worked with Sam uh, to create a piece on my arm that is healing plants in Harry Potter. So um, different plants that are mentioned in the, uh, the Harry Potter series, book one through seven, um, whether it's like the plant itself is directly healing like dittany um, or used in a potion that is used for healing or relieving anxiety, things like that. And so I'll show it to you. I'm really, really excited with how it turned out. Um, it's a little bit hard to show off, but... And I just got it a few days ago, so it's kind of in a weird healing phase. But it essentially just looks like really, really beautiful. Plants. This is a mandrake, which I think is the most obviously Harry Potter-esque of all of the plants. <laughs> 
it's uh it's definitely the most obvious to be kind of from the Harry Potter series but my plan is you know despite being a doctor I think that the arts are incredibly important and I have talked about this before but um the arts are important for so many different reasons, not only because they bring beauty and creativity to our world, but because that creativity fosters different thoughts and actions and different perspectives that allow you to see um, scientific queries in different ways, which for me is incredibly important. Art and medicine I think are very, very interconnected, not only because of the importance of understanding a huge population of the country um, and helping to serve those artists, but also because having an artistic and a creative mind helps you interpret patients and think about um, diagnoses and what could be going on in a more creative way and sort of think outside the box of what could be happening. And so I think that the arts are incredibly important. And so despite being a doctor, I'm planning on getting a full sleeve. <laughs> um, I think I'll probably stop somewhere kind of mid arm so that I can wear a long sleeve and not have any tattoos showing. But in general, I think that the world is kind of moving away from this idea that professionals and medical professionals can't have any art on their bodies. And so, um, yeah, that's my plan. I am actually in the works with um, another artist, another tattoo artist here in Denver to get another addition to this. Um, and I might get it here or up on my shoulder. And I'll talk about what I'm planning on getting a little later when I talk about the book I'm reading right now because I'm obsessed with it. It's one of the best books I've ever read and I definitely want an ode to it on the body forever. So anyway, with that, I've waffled on for 12 minutes now. So I think I'm going to move on to the crafty chat and I have a lot to talk about. So I'll start off with some finished objects. I have two finished objects, one of which I do not have with me. So um, since we last talked, I did finish my first ranunculus, which um, I was knitting for Miriam for her 30th birthday. Her 30th birthday was um, on the 9th of May. And so I got to go spend her 30th birthday with her, which was so magical and um, gave her her ranunculus and she's a beautiful New York City gal who loves black and wears black all the time and so she loved it she wore it the whole week that we were there you know taking it with us um, during evenings when we were going out to dinner and things like that and it looks so beautiful and I will put some um, clips of that later to later in the podcast um, when I put a bunch of clips about kind of our my New York trip. And in that, you'll actually get to see some paintings from the MoMA. So um, modern art is my favorite kind of art. And my husband, this was his first time ever going to New York City. And so I had to take him to the MoMA, which is one of the most amazing art museums in the world. I would say the MoMA and the Pompidou are my two favorite art museums like ever. Um, and the Pompidou is the Museum of Modern Art in uh, Paris, France. And so um, got to see that. And there are some beautiful Klimt pieces, some beautiful Van Gogh pieces, and some other beautiful sort of more modern art as well. So anyway, with that, um, I finished my first ranunculus and my second ranunculus. <laughs> So this was a project that I brought with me to New York and also knit a lot before I even got to New York. So my second one, I was using these two yarns. So one is Le Petit Mohair from uh, Biche Bouche. And this is in their like mustard yellow color, which is so beautiful. It's catching the natural light and it looks gorgeous. And then I also knit it with um, some La Bienne May in the, I think it's the Grello colorway. This is a yarn that my mom and Aunt Susie brought back for me from their trip to Paris. Um, so I held these two together and made this incredible sweater. Um, 
So this is my ranunculus, which oh, this has not been blocked yet. Um, and so has, you know, I'm sure it will look even more beautiful after it's been blocked, but I really, really loved how it turned out. Um, I knit everything to pattern, I believe. Um, the cast on, I think I used a smaller needle than was recommended. Uh, but other than that, I used the regular needles. I wanted it to be oversized and flowy. Um, and in terms of the sleeves, essentially what I did is the ranunculus does have you work some short rows in the sleeves and I omitted those because I was being lazy and just knit them straight and then did the um, sort of decreases in cast off as the pattern calls for. I did knit the body quite a bit longer than what the pattern called for. And as you can see, I still have some, this is all that I have left over of two skeins of, um, of the La Bienname and the singles. And so I still had, you know, I probably could have gone another inch if I wanted to, just for your own, um, for your own planning. But yeah, I absolutely love it. I think it's something that I am gonna wear all the time. It's so soft, it's so light and warm. And yeah, this is how it looks. Oh my gosh. So it's still pretty cropped. My belly button is like, where is it? Right here. Uh, so it's definitely still cropped. I think it's going to grow quite a bit and I just love, oh my God, it's so good. It's so good. Um, so yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, this is, I mean, everybody has knit this sweater a million times and I am definitely late to the party, but wow, is it not just the most beautiful sweater. And I think it's perfect for spring. It's just this beautiful, light yellow sweater. I'm having a yellow moment. That's something that I realized, like, I feel like my uh, Nordiska, I believe it's the Nordiska, the Nordiska, I think. The last sweater I knit was yellow. I have some yellow in the sweater I just recently cast on. This is fully yellow. So I'm having a yellow moment and I'm kind of here for it. I love the yellow. So yeah, adore, adore. And yeah, I don't think it will be my last, especially, and I feel like everyone says this, but because it just makes such a good gift. It just makes such a good gift. It's really fun, it's really easy, it's beautiful, and something that anyone can wear and pull off and look gorgeous in. So I'm definitely gonna stretch, you know, I'm definitely gonna try to, I want it to be like really wide. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm excited to uh, block it and see how it grows and changes. But yeah, I mean, I loved it. I did do the helical knitting technique in the body to try to prevent any pooling of the yarn, but I did not bother with do doing any helical knitting in or alternating of skeins in the yoke, and nor did I alternate any skeins or care at all what was happening in the sleeves, and things turned out great. So I definitely don't know if I even needed to alternate skeins, skeins uh, during the body, to be honest, because it just like looks amazing. And I also do think that mohair will kind of airbrush a multitude of sins. And so use that to your advantage when you're knitting. So that, those are my finished objects. The other knitting talk I have, um, I'll move on to my sock, which I did not knit a whole lot on this sock, but this is my first ever color work sock, which is a sock that I am knitting out of some scraps as well as less traveled yarn in this really beautiful peachy pink colorway. And this was just a really quick pattern that I made up <laughs> as I was knitting. And I really like the way that it's turned out. It fits my foot really great. And I'm not doing any color work on the foot of this. It was only on the, what is this part of the sock called? I don't know. I can't remember. It's gone. 
Anyway, this part of the sock has color work. This part of the sock does not have color work. And yeah, I'm just sort of knitting away on this. I have come to the very strange realization that the sort of plasticky feel of superwash yarns is something that I don't love knitting on anymore. And I think part of it is because I've spent so much time knitting on non-superwash yarns that now when I knit on this, it feels plasticky to me. Um, but I still love superwash yarns. And so hopefully that'll get better. But yeah, so this hasn't been like the thing that I am drawn to knit right now. Especially because I was just knitting um and then doo -doo -doo, the other thing that I have to show off is I have just made a little bit of um a little bit of work on my Birch Creek bandana which I really really love. I am knitting this out of this silky single bait, the silky single in gilded colorway, and then this really beautiful fiber for the people, uh, Surrey, which the effect of them together is incredible. I really love it. And I honestly don't really mind purling, which I think most people don't like it because they don't, or would have trouble doing this or knitting anything flat because they don't like purling, but I just don't really mind purling at all. And I'm really enjoying it. I really think it's beautiful. I particularly like this side. Oh, so really enjoying this. I'm essentially just planning to knit this until I run out of yarn. So we'll see how far I get, but yeah. Um, and then one last thing that I have been knitting grab a sip of my kombucha here. I'm drinking this out of this really beautiful little cup that a very dear friend of mine made with her own bare hands. Okay, so I cast on a new sweater. I know I shouldn't because when I look around my house, I have so many sweaters that are in various states of un undress, so to speak. Um, but I just, I wanted something, after knitting on the ranunculus, it was a lot of stockinette in the round. I was doing a lot of stockinette and I wanted something while I was on vacation that I could get completely lost in and spend hours just lost in my knitting. And so wanted to cast on something really complicated and I have succeeded in that. Uh, I cast on the bouquet sweater by Yonko Okimoto, I believe is her name. And I may have butchered that or gotten it wrong. So I will obviously put it down, but I'm knitting this. I was very much inspired by Mary Lisa of the Girl Meets Yarn podcast. She knit this sweater out of the same yarn and I saw it and I said, mine. <laughs> um, this was actually a gift for, from my mom for when I graduated medical school. So just now casting on with this beautiful yarn. This is um, the Brooklyn Tweed Shelter, the worsted weight, Brooklyn Tweed Shelter in the newsprint colorway, which is just a black and white yarn, as well as, can't remember what this one is, Yellowstone maybe? I'm not sure, but they're really beautiful sort of yellow yarn. So again, I'm having a yellow moment and I'm still in the yoke. This has been I mean, it's amazing, but you know how when you're doing color work and you're like, oh, I can just like read my color work and it'll be not so bad. That's not how this is. This is like each row for all of the repeats, you're having to like read exactly what you're supposed to do. Like it requires a lot of thought and a lot of intention, but here we go. I am up. Obsessed. Um, it's a little bit hard to show off. Mm. 
Love it. And I just love her use of the strands in the front. It's the first time I've ever gotten to do this technique. And I love it. So this is the bouquet sweater, my bouquet sweater. I am really loving it. I will say, um, let me just kind of show you this part. So you can see that the floats in this sweater get to be very long. So from here, I think the last color work is here and it goes all the way until here. So that's like 30 or 40 row or 30 or 40 stitches that you're having to hold the opposite color. And there's a lot of different ways that you can choose to catch your floats. And I have talked about this a little bit in the other sweater that I am working on right now um, that is also a color work sweater, and that is the ladder back jacquard technique. And I learned that on that sweater so that I could knit this sweater because I knew that the floats were gonna be really long. And it's a little bit hard to see because it's not blocked <laughs> and it's also on too small of a needle, in fact, or too small of a cord, rather. <laughs> um, but I think that you'll be able to tell that my floats, you cannot see really at all. And I don't, it's a little bit hard for you to tell, but it's not like bunching or pulling or anything like that, which is amazing. And what I have been doing, let me fix this because I'm dropping stitches left and right to chat with you about this. Um, but what I have been doing is the ladder back to card technique. And essentially what this is, is creating a another layer of knit fabric that allows you to catch your floats. It's a little bit hard to describe, but I will um, attach the YouTube tutorial that I use to learn this technique. It's super, super easy. And let me just show you what it looks like on the inside. So the outside looks like this. You literally cannot see the floats. But look at this, what? And it's a little bit hard to tell, but this is a separated fabric on the back. What, it's crazy, it's so crazy, it's so crazy. And so I have been using this to catch my floats about every five stitches, more or less, and the, when you block it, my understanding is that it even relaxes a little bit more and it just makes this really beautiful, really simple way to catch your floats. I'm obsessed. It's so cool. So I highly recommend if you are knitting any sweaters that have like crazy, crazy long floats, try letter back to card because at least for right now, it appears to be working very well. So I'm really excited. I've used it a bunch of different times. So you can see I kind of used it here as well. It's really easy to just pop in a stitch if you're like, oh, things are getting a little long here. Uh, you can really easily just pop in another stitch and go from there. So I have really, really been enjoying learning and using this technique and it's really easy. And so, if you are knitting the bouquet sweater or any sweater that has really, really, really long floats, I highly, highly recommend looking up Ladder Back Jacquard and giving it a go because it's been a lifesaver on this. I honestly don't know what I would do without it. And you literally, like, you just can't see it. So you can see here where the jacquard stitches are. So those run all the way down here you can't see it. So amazing. I am really, really enjoying this knit. 
It is super, super challenging. Uh, it only comes in one size, but I would also say that it is knit, at least in the in this yarn, at an extremely tight gauge. Like, this is gonna be a bulletproof sweater, I swear. It's insane. Um, so you could definitely switch up the gauge to make it bigger or smaller, and that would actually be very easy and very doable. So if you wanted to make it smaller, you could use a smaller yarn. Um, so something like a DK weight or a fingering weight. And if you wanted to make it larger, you could honestly uh, use a bigger needle because it's knit on a very small needle for worsted weight yarn. Or alternatively, you could use a bigger needle and a larger yarn. There's like lots of different variations you could do. I did not get gauge, so my gauge is a little bit off, but I would have to go down another needle size to get the correct gauge. And I was just like, no. Like, this is as tight as I'm willing to knit this because it already feels like really dense fabric. And so it's just gonna be what it is. And if it's really, really oversized, then I think that that's something that I will still love, especially because with how dense the fabric is, I think that it's definitely gonna be more of an outerwear type garment. So I'm loving it. I'm just loving it. That is all the knitting talk, but I actually do have some sewing talk to talk about. So Mara Lisa posted on her Instagram, I believe this is called the Hallen dress, and I absolutely fell in love with it. It is this sort of high neck with a very low plunging back that has ruffles and sort of ruffling around, not ruffling, um, like ruching around the back as well as around the bottom. And it is gorgeous and perfect for the summer. And so I started sewing one. I have this absolutely beautiful fabric that has flowers and snakes and bugs. And it's just super, super earthy. So good. And I have gotten to the point where it's a little bit hard to show, but I, all I need to do is attach the last piece to finish the arm and do the hem and that's it. But again, Sewing is something that I tolerate because I think it's really fun to have your own sewn garments. However, I find it extremely tedious. And I don't know why, because I don't find knitting tedious, but I find sewing incredibly tedious. But this is gonna be the back. So you can see that it's kind of this low back that has just this beautiful ruching. I'm obsessed. I think I'm going to absolutely love this. So I will hopefully finish this before our next podcast and maybe I'll wear it and kind of give you a longer view of it so that you can see what the dress itself actually looks like. But this is the Howland dress. It's absolutely beautiful. I think it's something that I'm going to wear all, all the time. <laughs> and while I was shopping to get some fabric for this dress, I got fabric to make like three of these because I was like, I'm going to live in those. I was there and we have so many new subscribers. It's crazy. We have over 300 subscribers, which is something that I never ever thought would ever happen in the world. And so I thought that it would be really fun to make a beautiful project bag. And I'll probably make two, one for me and one for someone once we get to 500 subscribers. So if you like the podcast, please subscribe. And as soon as we get to 500, then I will put in a little raffle for this project bag. So I obviously haven't made it yet, but in general what I do, and um, I believe that I showed off a project bag that I then sent in the mail to a friend a while back, but I really like waxed canvas. So this is waxed canvas, and I really like this to be on the base of the bag because it gives it just a really sturdy bottom that can withstand like anything. Like this stuff is the real deal. So 
This is this beautiful wax canvas that has a plaid motif. So it's got a plaid motif that is stunning. And it's mostly like a dark green with purple and orange or brown. It's a little bit hard to know. So I wanna use the bottom, have the bottom be this beautiful plaid. And then I got some fat quarters from Fancy Tiger Crafts, which is my craft, my craft store. So I got, I'll just sort of show them off. This one with the mushrooms. And I thought that I would just use these to make a really beautiful quilted top to this bag. I love this one. So we'll see how much I can get out of these. This is the color palette. Is that not amazing? I saw these and I was like, yes, yes. That needs to happen. And so yeah, I'll see how many I can get out of it. I think if I can do three or even four, that would be amazing because then I could choose a couple different people to receive a little gift in the mail from me. So I'll take you on the journey of making these bags and hopefully soon we'll get to 500 subscribers and I can send one out to one of you. I just, I really love little sewing projects. I think the thing that's hard for me with sewing garments is that it's pretty time consuming and has to be very precise. And so it just is a little tedious where these little tiny little bags or, you know, strips that you're sewing into something beautiful, it's just easier. It's easier to do. But anyhow, that is all of the crafting talk I have. And so I am now gonna move on to what I have been reading. Books. I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, okay, so let's get into it. I have been reading three books, I believe, since I last spoke with you. Could be wrong about that, but I think it's only been these three. So the first is that, well, I guess it's kind of four, but I honestly count these books as all the same. Um, so the first books that I have been reading are, I am in the midst of rereading the Harry Potter series for the like 20th time. And I will say that when I was flying to New York, I was very anxious. I think I talked about this during my last podcast and just my anxiety surrounding the trip to New York around being in a metal tube going 500 miles an hour in the air, all of these things, you know, that I have done a lot of traveling. I've lived in both Tanzania as well as Slovakia. I have traveled a lot. And for me to be so scared of traveling has was a completely new and strange experience. I will say that for anyone else who is worried about traveling, once I got there to the airport, I was fine. You know, I was a little bit anxious, but in general, I was fine. The flight itself was fine. Everything was fine. And so all of these anxieties that I had sort of built up in my head were totally valid because that's the way that I was feeling. However, just so you know, when you start traveling again, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be just as easy as it used to be. You're gonna be fine. I will say that two things that really, really helped a lot during this experience were these two essential oils, which you can get at like any supermarket in Colorado, which means like probably health food stores in other states, but they're everywhere here. So um, these two essential oils, this one is just lavender. 
And this one is peppermint. These are two essential oils that I carry with me all the time because they are incredibly helpful for anxiety. So oftentimes I will just sort of put a little bit on, you know, a few drops on my wrist, rub it here and then rub it here so that it really wafts into my face. And I found that to be incredibly soothing and relaxing. And so if you're having anxiety around traveling or just any type of anxiety, these are something that I bring with me to work in little tiny vials, but I bring um, essential oils with me to work because I find it really helpful when I'm feeling really overwhelmed to gr help ground myself. And they also, uh, added benefit, are really great for headaches. So <laughs> I will also rub them on my temples if I feel like a migraine or um, tension headache coming on and I find them to be soothing and helpful for that as well. So, you know, I am a medical doctor, I have an MD, however, I believe in the healing power of essential oils. So um, yeah, thought I would mention that for anyone who's getting ready to travel. So I was having some anxiety with my trip to New York and when I'm feeling anxious, I like to be grounded by a story that I know what's coming but feels like home to me and allows me to delve into a world that brings me so much joy and comfort. And that is the world of Harry Potter, as I've always already mentioned. And so I, I do a reread of the whole Harry Potter series every year. Um, and I've been doing that for a while. And there was a few years during medical school where pretty much all I was reading was Harry Potter over and over and over again because it was like the only thing that would help my anxiety. So um, I just finished my reread of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and right now I am rereading Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. I would say that the Order of the Phoenix is probably my least favorite of the Harry Potter series but it's still like one of my favorite books of all time. And my favorite book is the sixth book, The Half-Blood Prince. I don't know why, I just love that book. It's so good, so good. But I thought that I would show off. My mom for Christmas um, has been getting me the beautiful illustrated editions of the Harry Potter books. And so I thought I would show these off because they are a really, they would be an incredible gift for anybody that you have in your life who is really, really into Harry Potter. I will say that I am a purist. And so if I ever have kids, I will probably hide these <laughs> because I want them to imagine the characters for themselves without seeing them first. And so I will be a huge stickler with that. And um, will really push them to kind of imagine the characters and imagine the world for themselves. And then after they have all read the actual books, then we'll sort of watch the movies and they'll get to see these amazing copies. But the artwork in here is amazing. For those of you who don't know, this is an illustrated edition of the novel and it contains the whole text. So when I first saw these books, I was a little bit, um, I was a little bit concerned because I thought that they were illustrated and then would then leave out part of the text. But in fact, they have the entire text and then intermingled, they have beautiful, beautiful drawings. So, um, for instance, this is the Durmstrang ship with Hogwarts in the background. So beautiful. This is a drawing of Ginny Weasley. Gorgeous. And sometimes, you know, they'll draw what's going on in the books, um, but like that, sometimes they'll just draw characters that are important in that part of the story. Um, there is one where Dumbledore is knitting, which is insane. This is the second task in which Harry is rescuing Ron and Fleur's little sister. It's just beautiful. I mean, the amount of work and art artistry that has gone into these books is insane. And they are definitely a splurge. I think each book is at least $50, which is a lot for a novel. Um, 
but the art that goes into it is like incredible. Um, so this is Cedric and Harry sort of deciding who's gonna get the goblet first. Ugh. So anyway, it's incredible. It's so, so, so beautiful. So if you have someone in your life who really loves Harry Potter, I highly recommend this as a, as a gift for them. Um, you can, you know, just start with one of the books, but it's, God, I, sometimes I just like to flip through it and look, I mean, look at the Boba Tons carriage. So gorgeous. So they have through the fourth book. So um, I obviously have the original hard copy versions of all of Harry Potter and then um, I'm starting to collect these as well. So wanted to point that out. So I read uh, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and I'm now part of the way through Harry Potter and the uh, Order of the Phoenix. And then I also started a couple of other novels. And boy, oh boy. I'll first talk about Hamnet. Um, so this is by Maggie O'Farrell. And this is such a beautiful book. This is the winner of the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction. And let me just read this to you because I think it is so beautifully describes what the book is about. England, 1580. The Black Death creeps across the land, an ever-present threat infecting the healthy, the sick, the old, and the young alike. The end of days is near, but life always goes on. A young Latin tuner, penniless and bullied by his, a violent father, falls in love with an extraordinary eccentric young woman. Agnes is a wild creature who walks her family's land with a falcon on her glove and is known throughout the countryside for her unusual gifts as a healer, understanding plants and potions better than she does people. Once she settles with her husband on Henley Street in Stratford upon Avon, she becomes a fiercely protective mother and a steadfast centrifugal force in the, young, in the life of her young husband, whose career on the London stage is just taking off when his beloved young son succumbs to sudden fever. A luminous portrait of a marriage, a shattering evocation of a family ravaged by grief and loss, and a tender and unforgettable reimagining of a boy whose life has been all but forgotten and whose name was given to one of the most celebrated plays of all time. Hamnet is mesmerizing, seductive, impossible to put down, a magnificent leap forward from one of our most gifted novelists. The London Stage. So this is not a giveaway because they talk about was given to one of the most famous plays of all time. And then it's literally like the first page you find out that Hamnet's father is Shakespeare, William Shakespeare. So this is beautiful. It is so lyrical, so gorgeous. It has... Um, a different timeline in which you're sort of going back and forth between um, what's happened in the past and what's going on now in the present of like 1580 and the Black Plague and oh my gosh it's so so beautiful so I'm about a third of the way finished with this novel and um, hopefully we'll finish it soon it is so so beautiful and I'm really enjoying it and it was actually recommended by one of the viewers so thank you so much um, I'm really, really enjoying it. And for all of you out there who um, have been thinking about books to recommend, please do, <laughs> because I generally do read the books that people want me to read because I'm always looking for new and amazing books. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a really beautiful read. So I'm really excited to continue on with that. And then... This book, I Have No Words. I Have No Words. This is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. This book has been through some shit, you know? Um, I, I'm obsessed. So I think what I'm going to do, because this book is very long. I am about 600 pages in. It's a 720 page novel. And I want to talk about it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a spoiler free description of what this book is. And then I'm gonna go in to all of the most amazing things that I have to say about it. So yeah, this book follows Kvoth, who is 
a young man. So uh, it's so hard to even, it's so hard to even describe. This is a fantasy novel that follows Quoth, a young man who you first meet when he is like a middle-aged man and he is, he owns an inn. And it comes to pass that this innkeeper knows more than he is letting on and has had a very interesting past and is actually a very famous, for lack of a better term, like wizard. <laughs> and then you, Quoth, who is the, the protagonist, starts to tell his story and goes back to his childhood. And then you follow him from his childhood in this book all the way through his life in sort of adolescence. And I don't wanna say more than that because I think one of the most beautiful things about this book is getting to learn about the world and the magic and being exposed to this beautiful, character development. I think that's the thing that I really, really love about this book is a lot of fantasy is very plot driven. I think most of the fantasy that I have read has been very plot driven. However, this is a very character driven fantasy. So I think that if you really love fiction, if you really love literary fiction, I think you will really, really love this book. And this would be a great foray into adult fantasy if you are so inclined. So um, let me read the back of it because I feel like I'm not describing it that well, but this is like the easiest five out of five I've given all year. It is so, so, so good. And I'm already getting, this is the book that I'm getting a tattoo because I think it will go well with my magical plants, you know, little name of the wind tattoo as well. So let me read this for you. And then I will switch into more spoiler talk. So my name is Quoth. I have stolen princesses back from sleeping Barrow Kings. I burned down the town of Traben. I have spent the night with Felurian and left with both my sanity and my life. I was expelled from the university at a younger age than most people are allowed in. I tread paths by moonlight that others fear to speak of during day. I have talked to gods, loved women, and written songs that make the minstrels weep. You may have heard of me. So begins a tale unequaled in fantasy literature, the story of a hero told in his own voice. It is a tale of sorrow, a tale of survival, and a tale of one man's search for meaning in his universe, and how that search and the indomitable will that drove it gave birth to a legend. It's so good. Oh my gosh. Seriously, if you don't, it, like, if you're a fantasy reader and you haven't read this like me, just stop everything that you're doing and read this book. If you're not a fantasy reader and you've never read fantasy before and you really like literary fiction, read this book. You're gonna love it. It's so good, it's so good. Okay. <laughs> you're on video. Oh, fuck, I'm on video? <laughs> This is a Maggie Kuznin original. <laughs> so I can't remember which if it's this building right here or the one we have like cool little like roof people thing. Uh -huh. But one of those is the closet. Okay.
Yeah, we only did yeah, five or six times since last time. 